for me, I'm currently seated on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respect to their elders past and present, and acknowledge that this land is not seated. So, welcome to day three of AESO's Design and Evaluation Special Interest Group Learning Sprint. What's the word there? Um, I'm Shani. I am a senior consultant at Clear Horizons. And I'd like to um, throw to our other facilitator today, Jo, to introduce herself. Thanks, Shani. Um, I'm also joining today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I would also like to extend those respects to the traditional custodians of the land um, that I'm on. Um, I am a, now a freelance evaluation consultant, have done um, previous work in uh, for on both the consulting and the commissioning side in not-for-profits. Um, uh, but I also use a lot of my time working as a mental health lived experience advocate. So kind of wear both of those hats in this work, which I think is really relevant for what we're going to talk about today. Back to you. Thanks, Joe. I realized I didn't introduce what I do at Clear Horizon. So I work across evaluation and design, which is a nice little sweet spot, mainly evaluating social innovation projects or uh, designing and evaluating with uh, culturally and linguistically diverse groups. I have seen a comment just come through from Belinda directly to me saying there's a bit of interference with my audio. Um, if anyone else is having a similar issue, let me know. And I might need to drop out for a moment to go find a pair of headphones. So let's hope it doesn't come to that, but just drop me a line if it continues to persevere. All right, so just a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. As you can probably see, this session is being recorded. So we'll be working in plenary for the better part of our time together, but we will be going into a breakout for a short period towards the end. The breakouts won't be recorded, this bit will. I uh, completely understand if uh, you would rather keep your videos off and, um, and do that during our recorded sessions, but we definitely encourage you to come off, video, uh, come off mute, share your screens and to participate in the breakouts that will come up later. Something else to note, we are going to be um, using Miro today as well. And so I'm going to share a link to the Miro board with everyone. And then I might actually need to throw to you, Joe, to just talk us through the introductions while I find a pair of headphones. So there's a link to Miro, everyone. And Joe, I'm just going to hand over to you for a second. Yeah, no worries. This is the joy of facilitating on the fly, doing things like finding headphones to make sure everyone can participate. Um, and we will also keep uh, periodically reposting that mirror link in the chat, just because I know that if you've arrived a bit late, you don't then get access to the previous chat. So uh, if we're talking about the link and you can't see it, just be reassured that you will see it again at some point in the future. Um, thanks, Bill. Bill's on it. Um, um, and I should note as well, Bill's here from the AES today, just giving us a hand with managing all the tech stuff. So um, in terms of what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to start with a little bit of uh, sharing from Shani and I about um, some of the um, kind of theoretical concepts that sit behind the idea of power and talking about what power is, what impact it has on your projects, and then what you need to be thinking about in terms of designing an evaluation while being mindful of power. Um, and we're also going to share um, a couple of um, case study examples as well, just to try and illustrate some of the things that we're talking about. Um, then we're we're going to move into um, some breakout rooms and the purpose of the breakout rooms is to provide um, a space uh, for you to come together and to think through in a really practical sense uh, what are some of the things that you can do um, before, during and after an evaluation process to identify and manage uh, power in the, the projects that you do. Um, and manage power is probably not the right word because that in and of itself suggests something about power, um, but I'm very much still working to find what the right word is, so we'll interchangeably use manage again knowledge, address, um, but know that they come from that spirit of, um, of thinking about how we do something about this, given that it's present in all of our projects. Um, Shani's back. Well, shall we just do a quick sound check? Let's do the moment of truth. Can you hear me? That's, I think, much clearer. Yeah, I think there was maybe just a bit of room echo before. Okay, great. 
Thank you everyone for bearing with me. Like Joe said, facilitation on the fly. Um, great, so Joe, thank you for holding down the thought as well. I'm gonna start sharing my screen um, and I hope everyone's been able to access Miro. I can see some curses in there. If you do have any trouble with Miro, please feel free to just put a comment into the Zoom chat and Joe and I'll be sure to help you out. Right. So let me know when you can share, see my screen, everyone. I can see that now. Perfect, thank you. All right, welcome to our mirror board. So for those of you who might not have used mirror before, mirror is quite literally an online whiteboard. It allows us to collaborate together, which is always very welcome. Just wanna draw your attention to the question bank that you will see um, underneath our frames for today. So this question bank is a spot for us to pop in our questions as we go. So Joe and I will be working through some content. And so if there's anything of interest that you'd like us to interrogate further, just drag one of the questions on the right-hand side of the question bag and um, pop in your question. Or you can do that in the Zoom chat as well. And we'll be coming to that at the end of our session and responding to any questions or queries that you have. Okay, so what are we doing together today? The other thing, just before we get into that, um, Shani, we covered this one while you were off the screen, so we can zip through it. But I also just wanted to draw your attention to the resource bank as well that sits under the question bank. Um, so as we go through, we'll be mentioning um, some things that that re and resources that we've drawn on. And there's some others in there that we find useful, but also um, there's, a, there's a lot of wisdom probably in this collective group. And so again, we encourage you to grab a post-it note. And if there's something that you use in practice that you think is great, um, chuck it in that resource bank because we'd love this to be something that you can come back to and draw on in the future. Um, back to you, Shani, sorry to jump in. Not at all, thanks so much, Joe. Well, I think you're actually keeping us off. Yeah. For you. yeah, back to me again. Um, so we thought for having our conversation about power, it was probably useful to start by actually having the conversation about what power is. Um, and this is one of these uh, one of these definitions that can be as long as a piece of a string. Um, but ultimately, power is about the capacity to impact and influence our environment. Um, and there's some work there um, by Julie Diamond that's linked to, um, and she talks about the um, there being kind of two different senses of power. Um, one is is the social power. And I think this is the one that we um, generally tend to think of in terms of um, evaluations and how they're designed. Um, those are the things that we've, uh, we talked about on Monday, if you were there around um, privilege and structural power um, and physical ability to contribute to things. Um, but the other thing that um, I wanna draw your attention to is also this dimension of personal power. Um, and that's the sense that independent of the structural power that you hold, you also have this internal source of power that you can draw from that guides your values and decision-making um, and your kind of holistic power, the total of that um, draws on both those different senses of power. So for example, um, in a project I did recently, um, there was, uh, it was a group of consumers and they recognized that while uh, there was a group of consumers with mental health lived experience and there was a group of clinicians, and traditionally you would assume that the clinicians held the power in that situation, there was one or two consumers who had really dominant personalities and that was shaping the nature of the discussion that happened in that space. And it was another dimension of power that needed to be accounted for in how that was managed. Um, we'll go to the next one now. Um, so I also wanted to just talk about this idea of faces of power, and this draws on the work of a few different uh, people who are mentioned there. Um, and this is basically just recognizing that um, power expresses itself um, in my mind, it's a bit like a liquid. If there's a if there's a gap that power can flow into, it, it fills it up there um, and uh, takes over that space. Um, so there's different faces of power that they talk about. The visible power is, I think, what um, 
we would probably most traditionally associate with power. It's the observable decision making, those formal formal structures that um, determine who gets to make decisions, how they get to make decisions, and um, the institutions that that power is vested in. Um, then there's this hidden power. And that's about setting the agenda of who even gets to have those conversations in the first place and who even gets to um, take part in that decision making. And then finally, there's the invisible power. And I think this also draws a little bit on some of the cultural values that we were talking about in terms of social power. Um, and this is this idea of shaping what is acceptable um, and kind of the cultural forces that give people power and again I think this is like strongly tied with the notion of privilege um, and that uh, you know privilege is a way uh, that this invisible power uh, you know they, they, they work hand in hand it's the invisible power and the privilege working together to shape what knowledge is and whose knowledges are more important than others in um, in this space and that's really important in evaluation and design when we're thinking about how we make decisions how we prioritize things um, and determining what knowledge is um, and we'll go to the next one which is when I will then stop talking and hand back to Shani again um, and so uh, this I think draws quite strongly on that work um, of the faces of power that I was talking about before um, and this is a diagram that I've put together based on the link that's provided there um, which I think is a really handy practice guide for thinking through how you practically work out uh, power in evaluation and design so I encourage you to have a look at it um, I won't necessarily go through these in a great deal of detail now because you can come back to them. Um, but um, Maya Goodwill identifies these kind of five different domains of power that uh, come to bear in a project. Um, and while they are listed there as separate boxes, I think the important thing to recognize is that they really all feed off one another. So um, power begets power. And if you have power in one space, it feeds into having power in another. And so you end up with these increasingly extreme and marginalized ends between the people who hold the power and the people who've been marginalized. Um, and this is based on things like um, access to decision making, ability to uh, influence decision decisions and um, the ability the, the power that you have from your role and the ability to identify what's legitimate um, and how you then influence how that plays out in particularly a group context. I'm going to hand back to Shani now who's going to give you some examples of what this looks like in practice. Yeah, thanks so much Karen. So um, I think that really sets up some of these examples too. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the work Clear Horizon has been doing, designing and evaluating in the alcohol and other drugs sector. So this has been a really interesting and challenging sector to work in. So for those who might not have heard me introduce myself, most of my work sits in the culturally and linguistically diverse space. I tend to do this because of my lived experience as a migrant um, to Australia, first generation migrant. So it's very interesting now designing and evaluating with a traditionally marginalized and, and criminalized part of um, our community, a community in and of itself, but I don't have shared lived experiences. So through this process, power really came to the forefront in ways that it wasn't coming to the forefront in my work with culturally and linguistically diverse communities. And some key lessons we learned through the process um, that I do want to talk about in the context of process facilitation generally are what you can see on the screen. So a lot of this work was done in the beautiful era that is virtual COVID and therefore we had to deal with issues like tech and sound like we've just did earlier today. So what that meant was um, some of these issues that probably play out every day um, were exacerbated or enhanced in some ways. And it really comes with key lesson one. So lesson one, lived expertise is not selective. It encompasses all of a person's lived experience. So often when we talk about power, we talk about how we share power across groups. And this really goes hand in hand with our push, our drive to have more voices at the table. We talk a lot about getting lived experience or lived expertise into our evaluation and our design. However, with getting lived experience or lived expertise to the table, we have to acknowledge that we are encompassing or we're asking someone to share very much all of themselves. No one can be selective about who or what they bring to a space. And especially in the alcohol and other drug sector, participating in evaluation design 
can come with emotional responses and sometimes um, having to revisit trauma. It's very important that we create safe spaces for that, but we also recognize the implications of the different power in the room. Um, so a good example was my um, work working with uh, people who inject drugs and peer workers who very um, honestly and frankly told us that um, they don't take well to authority. And our role there as process facilitators automatically put us in a position that they um, aligned or thought was akin to that of authority. And so there was this issue of social power that was coming through to go back to the terminology Joe was using earlier. And uh, that comes into that second point there as well, which talks about there being no such thing as perfect power sharing. So one of my most controversial lessons, um, definitely one that can be provocative in and of itself, but the reality is where there are roles, it is often impossible to perfectly share power in a process. And um, that happens when someone is holding a technical expert or process role. So again, in that particular example, of how someone's lived experience can color um, how they approach a particular room. In that experience, in that same example, I was talking specifically about the emotional response to authority. And um, in reality, you're holding a process, you're holding some level of decision-making power that can then create a power differential within this room as well. The final lesson I just wanted to share in the context of our work in the alcohol and other drug sector is that uh, you need to be prepared for continuous iteration when you're revisiting and interrogating power in your work. To genuinely address power, you need to be able to revisit and challenge your own processes because often those processes um, don't always work because have feelings, emotions, and even the perception of power is not static. It's dynamic and it responds to those in the room and circumstance, and so that can change as well. I'll just stop there and ask you, Joe, if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, I just want to particularly expand on point two there about there being no such thing as perfect power sharing. And I think there's particularly no such thing in the kinds of work that we typically do in evaluation, like I flagged in my provocation on Monday. There's usually somebody driving why and how you're doing the project and that in and of itself is a form of power that can't be overcome um, but the really important thing is to be transparent about that because acknowledging that there is no perfect power sharing means saying we know we're not doing this perfectly rather than pretending you are pretending you are doing things perfectly is in itself a a form of holding power and kind of lying essentially to your participants that they are equal when they're not really um, back to you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Joe. And so this is just one of many examples that we could probably spend the rest of our session unpacking together. But it was one that I just wanted to bring to the forefront when we talk about the impact of uh, power on our work in evaluation. If you want to look ahead to the future and think about what we do um, when we navigate power in our work, well, it comes down to how we might identify power. And so I'm just going to share one tool that I often use in my work. And this comes from ThinkPlate and co-creative consulting, and it's called the Four Voices of Design. So what this does is it maps out the different stakeholders in a design process. And I think it's equally relevant to evaluation as well. Often I use it in my evaluation work. So you see four voices there, there's a voice of intent, and that is really the driver of any process. That's the intentional voice who's bringing together and mobilizing the work that you do. So you can understand the voice of intent to be a funder. Uh, it's, it's often your client. If you are a consultant evaluator, they are, they are the voice of intent who's bringing, and, uh, bringing together and operationalizing the work that you are here to deliver. Then you've got your voice of design. That's really talking about that technical process role. And so it could equally be the voice of evaluation. And that would be the people in the room here today. So we often are the evaluators the designers walking into a space. And we're there to help guide a process and to hold a process. Now you see two other voices there. There's one that's called the voice of experience. Um, I love this particular schema, but I often like to think of it as the voice of lived expertise. I think um, experience has relative to that other voice of expertise tends to undermine the value of uh, lived expertise in the room. So we're going to call it voice of lived expertise as opposed to experience, if that's okay with everyone. And those are usually the beneficiaries of the program. 
those are often um, the kinds of communities that we've just discussed, whether that's in the alcohol and other drug sector or in the culturally and linguistically diverse communities as well that we often work in. And what do they bring to the table? They bring, um, from a design standpoint, they often bring user experience. They understand and they live the programs that we're often there to evaluate or to design and are very valuable. But they also bring traditional and cultural knowledges and other types of knowledge that we don't often factor in to the work that we're evaluating or designing either, because they sit outside of the mainstream um, ways of thinking or logic models that we can often apply, a theoretical framework, so to speak. The last voice you see in there is called the voice of expertise. So in design, a voice of expertise here refers to real technical expertise. So if you think about um, a design process, and if you're here to design an employment program, let's say, um, your voice of expertise might be other employment service providers, other, um, other employment program designers who bring in that third party or independent viewpoint into your work. If you think about it in evaluation, we often talk about um, bringing in expert panels to help review evaluative judgments that are made. So that might be the voice of expertise that you talk about in that particular regard. And so this is um, something that I often use when I come to thinking about power and why, because by identifying the roles that we play in a process, it's then a bit easier to unpack the power associated with those particular roles. And so that goes back to the hidden power, the other kinds of power that um, Joe was talking about. Often it's easy to peg them to a particular role. And you can then use things like role identification or role and power mapping to then test how your power sharing has to go. So if you identify who fits into these particular, um, these particular categories and you know what power is associated with that role, and if the intention is to share that power, you can then use these kinds of schemas to come back and test how you're going against that at different parts of your evaluation or design process journey. Right, so that's just one tool I've used. Joe, are there any other tools um, that come to mind for you when you talk about identifying power in your work? I think I have mainly used most recently that um, wheel that I demonstrated before um, because it, it can be used as kind of a checklist for um, just making sure you're thinking about those other types of power and stepping beyond. Um, again, as I flagged on Monday, I think we tend to think of power in terms of privilege and whose voices are in the room. But I think both of these tools are really good at um, prompting you to think about how those voices get expressed, not just what the voice is. Yeah, and they can be used in conjunction as well, actually. So we've been using these tools um, in isolation, and now I can see how they can really be brought together um, in very productive and useful ways. And you food for thought moving forward. Yeah. So and I think that goes to the point where we're providing you with some ideas today, but there's absolutely no one way of determining this and we're far from the first people that have thought about power in this context um, so i think it is about finding the thing that works for you yeah thanks joan so putting this particular tool in practice this is um, another case study i just want to bring to the table so this is a project that's very close to my heart it's called uh, flemington works the flemington works is a place-based initiative in uh, flemington so in inner north um, Melbourne. And it is funded by the Department of Jobs and Precinct. And the whole purpose of Flemington Works is to improve employment outcomes for women and young people residing in the Flemington housing estate. So in October 2018, Co-Horizon was called in originally to co-design an employment program with women residing in the housing estate. And one of the first things we did was to try and mapping roles to power. So we used the four voices of design to understand who had a stake in the process and how they were being engaged in that process. So we had um, Clear Horizon acting as the voice of design in that particular case. Mini Valley City Council, um, who fund and house Flemington Works, they were a voice of intent. Our voice of lived expertise were the women from Flemington House and Estate and a voice of technical expertise were other employment providers that existed in the ecosystem. When mapping roles to power, we then tried to identify ways we could power share. And the most clear way was to actually embed the voice of lived expertise into our voice of intent. And so what happened was um, Flemington Works actually recruited project support officers for the duration of the project. 
home community to participate in designing. And how that's different from other co-designs is it's actually brought a different level of um, authority and decision-making power to their role. They quite literally had a position description that listed how and where they influenced this process, as opposed to, in some cases, where collaboration with community can feel a bit consultative because they're called in for workshops as opposed to participating in a process from start to finish. So that was our community co-leadership approach. And that's a leadership approach that we currently undertake. We've been working with Flemington Works for the last um, ooh, three years now, I guess. And we've now embedded that co-leadership approach into our evaluation work. We've recently helped them evaluate their model um, as they move into their new funding round with the department. And it's, it's proven to be a really effective way of trying to check some of that power that comes with engaging lived expertise without really engaging and giving them decision-making power in the process. Other ways that we tried to tackle power was um, through establishing a, work, a working culture using co-developed ways of working. It wasn't just about recruiting lived expertise into the process. We actually had to have very clear ways of working where we could meet each other um, at a better middle ground. And so that was co-developed and tried and tested. It gave us a way to check in with ourselves and have reflection points. So that was our method of interrogating our process, which I mentioned earlier. We were also able to create accessible and culturally appropriate. Gotta love it when you find a typo. I was like, it's gotta be one. Now I found it. Culturally appropriate data collection analysis tools. And we were able to do that um, by working with the project officers throughout the process. To then actually scale out some of the tools we use. So at Clear Horizon, we use um, most significant change quite often. And we were able to scale out a, um, a interview guide that drew on the most significant change tool such that we, uh, we conducted about 10 interviews ourselves and the project support officers were then able to scale it out to the community and increase it by fivefold based on how the tools were structured and how we applied the logic um, in a way that makes the most sense. But the most important mechanism there would have to be the embedded community feedback mechanism. And so that's again, recognizing that when we identify those forces of power by moving our um, voice of lived ex expertise into a role of um, a voice of intent, we'd actually lost some of that accountability at the table that existed outside of the process. So it was, it's recognizing that there are more and other people um, from community in this case, who would be impacted and would participate in such an employment program, who needed to be uh, represented and their views had to be accounted for. And so by having an embedded community feedback mechanism that extended beyond our work with our project support officers, we were able to expand out and get more voice of ex lived expertise to the table. All right, so that was um, a run through of that particular case study. We're about to move into um, a collaborative exercise we want to do in breakout. But before I get there, Joe, is there anything you wanted to add to the content we moved through today? No, I think so. Let's jump into the breakout rooms. And I've, there's a couple of questions in the question bank already that we'll get to when we come back from the breakout room. But add any more that you have in there as we go. Right. All right. So what are we going to do in our breakout? We've talked a lot about what has and hasn't worked for us in the past and what we need to think about. Now we want to try and bring that to the table so we can learn from each other. Like Joe said, many people have done this before us and by no means are we experts, the only experts in this space. So in our breakout groups, we'd like to work on identifying how we might address power before, during and after an evaluation, drawing on the experiences and the expertise of everybody else in this workshop today. So we've got these little um, frames in there. And the frame's divided into before, during, and after an evaluation. I encourage you to just use the post-its to draw out um, ideas that you might have. And once you've been able to populate the frame, you will notice there are some gold stars in a box on the top right-hand side of your screen. We'd like everyone to just pick up um, three stars maybe and to identify which of these ideas they would like to see in both their work and other work moving forward. So I can see people are already getting started. Joe, I might throw to you to get us into a breakout. I sat in on some really interesting conversations. Um, I was just, uh, there are a couple of things. I'm like slowly working my way across the board. There's a couple of things in the question bank um, 
that are in there, but uh, which we can start answering. But if there's anything else that anybody wants to add, feel free um, to pop a question in there or to put something in the chat. We've got about 10 minutes um, to talk through some things. Um, I do have an answer ready to go to both of the questions, but Shani, did you want to go first on either of them? Okay, oh, jump, jump in. I'm, I'm still getting to that, so yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I think the reason I have one ready to go on the on the the blue one that's in there about evaluating a project um, and whether we should acknowledge power dynamics in a report and how you go about doing that, uh, I have an answer in mind because we just discussed that in the, one of the breakout rooms that I was in. Um, and in my mind, I see that as much like you would acknowledge um, methodological constraints or um, differences in any kind of approach that you use. You know, it's not unusual in um, a quantitative paper to say there was a sampling bias with this survey that we used. And I think similarly acknowledging that in the same way in a report um, can be really helpful because I think one of the, and you know, I'll bang on about this, but I think one of the most insidious ways that power is used is by not being transparent and keeping some things hidden. And so the more that you can put out there openly to people so that they're making decisions off the basis of true and accurate and full information to them, the better the outcome you're going to get and the more power equitable within that context of nothing being perfect um, that you're going to get. Um, Shani, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that one? Yeah, no, I, I definitely would agree that um, acknowledging power is so integral to what we do. And we, we actually talked about the concept of like, what's the end game? Like, why are we acknowledging power to begin with? And in my head, there are two answers. I can answer um, with my values. I can answer with slightly more pragmatic consultant in me. And, um, you know, and the answer is quite literally, it's not addressing power. We're often um, continuing to let these blind spots perpetuate or we're getting, or we can actually see entire processes fall apart. And evaluation is discontinued because power, um, the lack of addressing power has actually resulted in really dangerous and harmful situations. So, yeah, acknowledging power is important. And therefore, I think it's important to then build that culture of embedding that into our reporting ways of doing this. So we're starting to see more rubrics being created and other kinds of uh, mechanisms to measure progress mapping against where we sit in some of the things we say. And that's a different, it's a type of acknowledging power. It's about accountability to the kind of um, processes that we're undertaking. So you can start to look at some of those mechanisms to maybe evaluate um, to some extent the process that we've adopted too. So it's about being able to say, okay, we've actually, um, you know, a very easy one to fall back on, but by no means perfect is the IAP2 spectrum. Like how much of, um, if we're saying we're doing participatory evaluation, where do we actually sit in that spectrum? How, how far have we gone in embedding certain principles into our ways of working? So that could be a quick way of trying to find a couple of bricks that exist to creating your own. Um, I definitely think there's a value to thinking more about how we, um, map power and power sharing in processes. So that could be a space that someone chooses to continue investing some thought and effort into. Yeah, thanks, Shani. Um, I might go to the other one that's in there now, which was um, about um, providing um, a bit of an example about the distinction between those faces of power. Um, so one that I might use, because I think it's a tangible one that we can probably all relate to is, um, I'll use the example of something like terms of reference that might be established for an advisory group. So in terms of the, the visible power that comes with that, the terms of reference are the visible power in and of themselves. They're the terms of engagement. What are the rules that this group has made um, for how decisions are going to be made, for who's there, um, all of that kind of thing. The, the hidden power that sits under the terms of reference is who's determined that the terms of reference is needed, who's written and developed those terms of reference, um, and who's made the ultimate decision about within those terms, who gets to make a decision. So that's then that kind of hidden power that sits behind that, um, with the visible being the terms of reference. I'd say the invisible power is then the bit that we probably don't get to most of the time is thinking about how have we even landed 
at this kind of social point that terms of reference are the thing that guides how a group works in that formalized structure of having, you know, that three, four page document that we all work through and agree. Um, how have we determined that having a kind of hierarchical committee structure that relies on terms of reference is the way that decision making needs to be made in this project? Are there other ways that we could think about distributing power and decision making through an organization that might be more networked or collaborative than some of those processes imply? Um, so I thought that was maybe a, a practical example to try and explain something that can be really quite academic and abstract. Um, yeah. Was there anything else that you wanted to add on that one, Shani? No, I think it was great. I was listening to you and going, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> That's it done, Joe. Yeah, I think it's something I've become really interested in the projects that I'm working in at the moment, because I do think the idea of the governance structures that we use around projects are an expression of power and often tie up with the concepts of privilege. So, you know, if you set up a project with an advisory board, you then tie yourself into, which I think is great, in abstract, but then you tie yourself into finding the eight to 10 people who are representative of all of the voices that you want to be involved in that project. And then you put the power on them to make decisions on behalf of the community. And you also put the stress on them to feel like they're making the right decisions on behalf of the whole community that they're representing. And you tend to get a certain group of people who have the capacity to um, navigate their way through traditional power structures, like being on advisory boards and that kind of thing. Um, so I yeah, I'm really interested in this idea of like, how do we do project governance in a way that in and of itself is power cognizant? Um, and again, this is something that I could probably rant about for a lot longer than the four minutes we've got left in this session. I think it, I just wanted to add one thing to that, Joe, because I think it really raises um, that question of that other dimension of personal and personal power and how personal power then plays a role in these spaces as well. So sometimes even the most well-intentioned processes create platforms um, intending to be, to diversify the voices, making decisions at the table, but then the makeup of those who's at that table as well can really impact how representative or unrepresentative decisions are. And I think there's that tension often with lived experience and being engaged in processes of having lived experience in the table, but then recognizing that Sometimes certain advocates are able to take that platform because they have more confidence in their personal power, but that might not necessarily reflect other views um, that are shared by slightly um, less engaged individuals um, who exist in the same communities as well. And that's something I grapple with a lot in my work. Absolutely too. Like I'm fully aware of my privilege as a lived experience person. We've got a couple of minutes. I've noticed Kara's raised her hand. So rather than me and you rambling on, let's go to Kara. <laughs> Yeah, look, I was just, um, this is the pragmatic eval evaluator um, in my in me talking now. And I think sometimes, sometimes we do have to balance what could be perceived as some pretty intense, not navel gazing, but getting down deep in the weeds versus just getting on with the job and the sorts of trade-offs that we have to make. And some of those advisory boards are put together to for efficiency. There's been a process where, where um, people have been selected and unless it's sort of like a playing favourite shoulder tapping exercise, those advisory boards have been put in for a good reason, um, actually to acknowledge the busyness of other people. So I guess I'm just saying that, yes, we need to think about that, but we also need to balance that with why were these put in place? Uh, what value are they adding? And, you know, sometimes... If you've got a, a little budget, but you're trying to get diverse views, that's a really great way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I d and I didn't mean to be um, totally negative. I think. Um, no, no. Right. But you yeah. know what I mean? Like sometimes we can, you know, as evaluators, sometimes we can really go to town and go down the river <laughs> holes occasionally. Yeah. I, I, I'm always in that sweet spot of trying to be pragmatic, but also think about what could we be doing doing differently and I absolutely appreciate that sometimes we just have to be pragmatic and get on with it. I think um, there probably is scope and I would say even in my own practice sometimes to be pushing back 
a little bit and going, well, how do we build the time? How do we build the budget? But I appreciate that that's um, not always something that can actually be done. And I certainly look at my own practice and go, well, that didn't happen there. Um, and I was going to say something else, but it's completely gone. And I've noticed that Vipool also has their hand up. So last question before we wrap up. It's probably more of a comment than question, but I think it's kind of making me think of who we are doing the evaluation for, because often the evaluation is not necessarily for program beneficiaries or end users. Often the evaluations are for clients, for donors, for people who are investing the money in the process. And I think it kind of problematizes the whole conceptualization of evaluation itself in a good way, not necessarily in, in a bad way, but kind of thinking through you know, how, how do we, and, and Shani and the group, we were discussing a bit about core design as well. So it just kind of, you know, is, is, is something worth reflecting on as well in terms of the whole concept of evaluation and, and, and the purpose of it as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think it comes back to, and the other thing that I just remembered as you were talking that I meant to say, um, it coming back to just being transparent about that, transparent about why a project's being funded, about what it aims to do, about how people are involved, um, about the attempts that were made to deal with, to navigate power, as France said before, um, even if you didn't get it perfect. So I think it's much better to be open about where you made mistakes than it is to try and pretend that they never happened in the first place, which is in the spirit of evaluation anyway. So, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir on that. Um, sorry, I talked again. Shani, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Yeah, I think that's great. There was something we talked about um, in one of the other groups. I was very bad at getting across the groups, I'm sorry, but it was the idea of, okay, so, you know, you've got to give something a go as opposed to not, but then what happens if you have done no harm and good as well? And it's a whole notion of spelling forward. And I think that's why understanding how we address power before, during, but after evaluations is very important. If we haven't got it right, how do we do it in a way? Or how do we learn in a way that doesn't undermine the experiences of those who might um, have found that experience difficult? And I think that's something we still quite haven't worked out because it's, you know, it's technically outside of the scope of the work that we do, but it shouldn't be. And so I think that's probably my challenge to everyone. Like, how do we get better at embedding failing forward into our business as usual? Great. Well, that's it. That's all the time that we've got because we've already run over by two minutes. Uh, it's been lovely talking to you all about this issue that I know is really passionate to our hearts and hope that we conveyed that to you. And um, we learned some things from you along the way too in the, the breakout route. Um, I just want to say thank you to Bill for being here and doing the tech side of things and the AES for um, this sprint this week. Um, and as I put in the comment, we'll organize to send around the Miro link so that you'll have access to the points that you've put in there and the resources and the diagrams and that after um, the end of this session. Um, so thanks very much. <laughs>